You're listening to the Assembly Call IU podcast and postgame show, the place where Indiana fans across the globe hang out online after every IU basketball game. Join us for our live broadcasts on Thursday nights and immediately following every IU game at our website, assemblycall.com. That's assemblycall.com. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call. Tonight, your Indiana Hoosiers hung on to eke out a 64-62 to win over Penn State on the road uh, in a game that uh, saw IU get off to an incredibly slow start and found themselves down 9 to nothing by the first media timeout. IU then uh, played pretty well toward the end of the first half and into the beginning of the second half, eventually building a double-digit lead before the wheels nearly came all the way off uh, and they ended up holding on for a victory. So a lot to talk about, a lot of positive moments for IU's young players in the game, uh, but some really you know questionable execution down the stretch that allowed the game to be closer than it really was uh, for the majority of the, uh, of the second half and even the latter part of the first half. So we're going to break it all down for you here tonight on the Assembly Call. I'm your host, Andy Bottoms, here with Ryan Phillips and potentially the coach, Brian Tonsoni. And uh, we're going to be talking about that big road win for IU, their first road win of the season on the Assembly Call Post Game Show tonight. So let's start tonight's show as we start every show, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. Uh, and for me, this was, Jared did not text in any suggestions, so you know we were able to really use our own discretion uh, as we worked through what the Banner Moment was for tonight. But for me, uh, it was the play of Rob Finnessy during a really key stretch in the second half. Uh, IU was, I believe it was a... I'm looking, it was a 54-50 to 50, uh, lead for IU. Lamar Stevens had just made it to. Finnessy then, you know, calmly knocks down a three. Uh, Morgan picks up his fifth foul, or fourth foul shortly thereafter. Finnessy dri- gets, drives to the basket, gets fouled, makes both free throws, picks up a big rebound in traffic, has another drive to the basket where he scores again. Um, got an assist to Fitzner uh, for IU's next points. So that's, I think, nine points in a row there that he either scored or assisted on. Uh, and forced a big jump ball in there at some point as well, I believe. So, um, you know, just a huge stretch for for Rob Finnessy and a guy who had struggled a little bit in the first half, really rebounded to play well in the second half and showed some, uh, you know, did, you know, ended the game with one turnover, but I thought showed some poise down the stretch, at least was, you know, not afraid of the moment, not afraid to take and make big shots uh, down the stretch as he finished with 12 points, five rebounds, five assists uh, on the game in his first Big Ten road game. Uh, as a freshman, I would say that is pretty good. Certainly had some moments and things that, you know, maybe he could do differently and, and will continue to improve on. But a good sign that a guy that young uh, being put in the position that he was really stepped up in key moments for IU uh, in a second half in particular where IU didn't get nearly the output from Romeo Langford that they got in the first half uh, and and did get eight points from Juwan Morgan. But, uh, you know, really needed somebody to step up with with Morgan on the bench during part of that key stretch where he, again, scored or assisted on seven of IU's nine points. So to me, uh, if this team's going to fare well in the Big Ten, it's definitely going to be uh, because of a guy like Rob Finnessy being able to really play under control and take control of things at the point. So uh, Rob Finnessy's play during that stretch was tonight's Hoosier Proud banner moment. And that moment is brought to you, as always, by our friends at Hoosier Proud and Homefield. At homefieldapparel.com, you will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel. And at HoosierProud.com, you will find great State of Indiana-themed apparel as well as our official Assembly Call logo shirts. Both brands, Hoosier Proud and Home Field Apparel, were started by an IU grad, and all apparel at both sites is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And with Christmas on the way, you should consider finding the perfect holiday gift for the IU fan or Indiana resident in your life at HomeFieldApparel.com and HoosierProud.com. Plus, Indiana's birthday is coming up, so start picking out your favorite Indiana tees and get ready for Hoosier Proud's Indiana birthday sale on December 11th. And don't forget to use promo code assembly at checkout today for 15% off your order on either site. Again, that's promo code assembly at hoosierproud.com and homefieldapparel.com. All right, time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team, which at this moment is just one man, Ryan Phillips. So, Ryan, uh, any rants for uh, for the game tonight? I think you could probably have your pick between either the officiating or I use late game execution or maybe a little bit of both. Yeah, it's, you know, road wins are road win in the Big Ten. They're tough to come by. I don't care who you're playing. Uh, So we'll just be happy with that. And, 
take it and move on. Uh, only shot 41.8% from the field tonight. I missed a lot of stuff in close. Uh, there was a lot of contact that wasn't called both ways. I would say that. Uh, and then to shoot 38.9% from three, not great. But they did shoot. They only missed three free throws, which has been a big bugaboo this year. 78.6%, 11 of 14, uh, which really free throws were the difference in the game because Penn State missed so many. They were 11 of 26, which was atrocious. Uh, and that, that really was a difference in the game for me. Uh, but I will say, I think you're right about Rob Finnessy. I think he was the difference in this game. And, you know, whenever there's a new president, they always have the moment. Oh, this is the, this is the day. This is the moment. This is the event where he became president. Tonight's the game where Rob Finnessy became Indiana's point guard. He's the point guard moving on. The fact that he came out and had 10 of his 12 points in the second half, five rebounds, five assists, one steal, only one turnover, uh, threw in a block as well. Mm. I don't know, Rob Fantasy getting a block, but I'm cool with it. The way he finishes at the rim, the way he can change his pace, the way that he can read the game, uh, he and Romeo Langford, just from a basketball IQ perspective, are phenomenal. And they are they're so far ahead of the curve for freshmen. Uh, I, I think Fantasy just separated himself from the point guard competition. I actually thought Devontae Green had a really nice first half. He came out in the second half and in about five minutes stretch had four turnovers. Uh, he actually had a really nice pass at one point to Rob Finnessy. It was a point guard to point guard pass in the post and, and Finnessy scored it uh, early in the second half. And I thought that when IU extended that lead early in the second half, Devontae Green had a lot to do with it. But then he just started turning the ball over. And it's the good Devontae, bad Devontae we've seen from time to time. And uh, after the, he had a couple big threes in the first half as well. I mean, he, he did some nice things. But the second half, he did not play well. And that reflected in his playing time late. You know, late in the game on the road, you didn't have your junior point guard in. You had your freshman point guard in. And that says a lot. And it says how much Archie and the staff trust uh Rob Finnessy to get things done, how much they trust Al Durham to get things done. And how funny is it that we're at a point, if I had told you when he stepped on campus that we'd be at a point in a year and a half where our most reliable shooter was Al Durham and he's hitting free throws, he's hitting threes. I mean, he's, he's becoming a guy who you need to have on the floor defensively and offensively. And, uh, that's a surprising development. I think for everybody, I always liked Al, but I did not think that he would be at this point, one of the main guys they're relying on. So uh, just a big game for fantasy. And I thought Durham chipped in really nicely as well. You're listening to the assembly call. This is Andy bottoms here with Ryan Phillips, and we're breaking down Indiana's 64 62 road win at Penn state. Uh, So let's talk Romeo. I think there's, it was kind of a tale of two halves for IU uh, in some ways, and even, you know, kind of a game within the game in the first half after the poor start, We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but you know, Romeo, uh, again, Juwan, you know, struggled a little bit, only played 12 minutes in the first half due to foul trouble. So Romeo picked up the scoring slack, really got hot during a stretch uh, during the latter part of the first half and finished the half with 15 points on five of 10 shooting, hit a couple threes, hit all of his free throws uh, and had four rebounds. Also got another uh, another facial injury uh, with a, you know, with some blood coming out of his uh, his forehead or his temple, you know, shortly before the half. Uh, and then in the second half, you know, he just took three shots, didn't get to the free throw line, uh, still played 17 minutes, so still logged a lot of minutes. Uh, so, Ryan, I guess first, you know, kind of talk about what was working well for him in the first half, and then what, if anything, did you see differently in the second half that Penn State did that limited him uh, as much after the break? I don't really know. I It just seemed like he kind of wasn't in... Uh, he wasn't as locked in. He was getting the ball. He played fine defensively. I thought uh, he got beat for he, he did, and he's done this a couple times. He got beaten on a few failed box outs, uh, block outs, and 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 you know guys went right by him and got rebounds. Uh, but again, that's freshman. You know he's probably never had to block guys out before, <laughs> so he did, he's just been able to get rebounds. So uh, that's something he's got to work on. But defensively, I didn't think he looked bad. Uh, he turned the ball over twice, once in the second half that I remember, maybe a second time in the second half, I don't remember. But uh, I, I remember one in the second half was just kind of a lazy pass. Um, or no, it was, he dribbled it. He dribbled it into the into the turnover. Uh, I, I don't know really what happened, but yeah, he didn't seem as locked in. But in that first half, he was the whole reason uh, that IU uh got got a lead and and was able to get into it and clearly as i tweeted out he was he was watching kobe step back videos this week because that was what he what was working for him it was a little step back twos and threes and and he was hitting them perfectly and uh you know what i think from from romeo that is when he's gonna have the most success though while he can make those amazing you know gorgeous step backs like that what 
when he's working at his best, it's going to be getting to the hoop. And you didn't really see that much of that today. And I think a lot of it was Penn State was being physical with him and bumping him off his drives. And I think that he's got to get used to that in the Big Ten. And if he gets bumped off the drives, he's still got to go. And he's got to try and, you know, sort of out-muscle that, get to the rim, get fouled. Uh, saw him try that a few times in the second half and just didn't get the buckets. And I think it discouraged him. So he wasn't forcing anything, though. And I think that that showed his maturity is that if his offense wasn't coming rather than force it like some guys would, he kind of just played within the offense and moved the ball. I also think that late, particularly the last five minutes or so, Indiana did a very poor job of getting the ball to he and Juwan Morgan in positions where they could do something. And that was part of the reason that Indiana, I don't think Indiana scored a field goal in like the last four minutes of the game. So that that has a lot to do with it. When you're not putting the ball in your leader's hands and your best player's hands, you're not going to uh, score. And it's particularly late, particularly on the road, because those star kind of guys are the ones who are going to get calls when they get into the when they're going to the hoop. The other guys aren't. And so the, Indiana has to get better at that. They tried to get the ball, but they didn't really force it to their to their uh, their stars. And they, they need to do that more. Yeah, that was the other thing I wanted to hit on uh, before we break was really the end of the half or the end of the game scenario. As you mentioned, Evan Fitzner made a jumper with 358 left that made it a 63-52 to 52 game. Penn State outscored IU 10-1 to 1, uh, over the remainder of the game. And, and it felt very much like, you know, as cliche as this will sound, that IU basically played not to lose and was just trying to run the clock out. Um, and they, you know, would over dribble a lot. I mean, I tried to write down all the possessions there. I mean, but they, um, you know, so they, they got the Fitzner to IU. Um, I think they turned it over the next possession, then fouled. They turned it over again. Penn State scored again. Um, Juwan Morgan had a miss. Justin Smith had that silly foul where he's, you know, being hustling, trying to go for the ball, but just not in a position where he needed to do that and fouled. Yeah, I think. Um, just took think, really bad care of the basketball, missed free throws. Al missed, you know, Al made the first one, missed the second. Fitzner gets fouled, missed the front end. Just really, really poor late game execution. And had the game gone on for another few minutes, I don't think, I'm not sure that IU was going to be able to turn it back on. But I mean, do you feel the same way I did where it was just like trying to really trying to hold the ball and, and kind of run things out, but not hold the ball in the right guy's hands as and, pr- and do it productively. I mean, a lot of times, you, you know, unless you're running out, literally running out the clock, you've got to have a set working. And I realize you want to draw it down to about 15 seconds and then run your play. But whatever you do is you have to run the play confidently and consistently. You can't just kind of like wing your way into it. Part of that is it's December. I mean, I know we're in the conference season now, but it's, it's December 4th. Things aren't going to be pretty right now. There's a, you know, there's still a t- a lot of learning this team has to do. I mean, two of the guys who were projected to start just came back from injury and aren't playing full minutes yet. Zach McRoberts is supposed to be out on the floor in a position like that, but he's not. Uh, and a lot of these guys aren't up to where they need to be condition-wise, and they also haven't spent a whole lot of time on the court together. So you expect, you know, if this were a regular non-conference game and it finished that way, you'd think, okay, they have a lot of work to do. But again, we're starting the Big Ten season now when it should be starting in a month. And and it usually starts in a month when the team is more locked in. It's not locked in right now. And, and so luckily they got through these two ill-positioned games, 2-0 and in conference, and can move on. And it's better than being, like right now, I know it was ugly, but we're sitting here now with Indiana 2-0 and in conference as opposed to 1-1 and or 0-2. You're happy with that. It was not pretty. There's plenty to learn uh, from these games, and there's plenty to develop and plenty to work on. But they're ahead of the curve right now, being two and zero, and they have a road win, which you're gonna. I mean, those are precious. You're gonna want four of those, four more of those this year instead of five now uh, that you've got one in the back pocket. So you've really got to focus and, and and get better here. And there's a chance to get better on Saturday against against Louisville. So uh, I thought honestly, for about 25 minutes of that game, Indiana played really well. I thought the middle 20 minutes of the game, they played very well. They were up about. I think 11 at one point uh, and we're playing pretty solidly and playing great defense, which I know we'll get to. They were playing great defense for a long stretch, kind of burned themselves out as it, as it, as the game kind of faded and Penn state made a comeback at home. I guess you expect that, but they didn't handle that comeback. Well, and that's something they've got to build on and get better at. Yeah. I mean, I would say really the middle 30 minutes were, were really good. I mean, Penn yeah, that's state, probably fair other than the first five really. between the, the, between the, the tip and the first media timeout and the last media timeout and the end of the game, Penn State outscored IU 19 to 1. So, you know, the rest of the game, IU outscores them by, oh, this is going to make me do quick math here, by 20. Um, and yeah. so, 
you know, they, I did think they played really well, but a struggle and something that they'll improve upon, I, I, you would hope. But but certainly a, a question mark as you go forward. Took really good care of the ball in the first half. Not so much in the second half. We'll talk about that uh, more as we get going here. So coming up, uh, we're going to continue our breakdown of IU's 64-62 win over Penn State. We'll point out tonight's meaningful moment you might have missed, and then we'll go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from the game. You're listening to the Assembly Call. Stick with us. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips, and we are breaking down Indiana's 64-62 road victory over Penn State. And it's time for tonight's meaningful moment that you might have missed. And, um, you know, certainly some of those individual fantasy plays were big. Um, There's a couple things that stand out to me, one of which, and I guess we'll use this as a segue to talk about Clifton Moore's uh, play and and unexpected lift uh, that he provided in the first half. But I thought there were a couple plays that just from an effort standpoint really stood out. One was the, the and one that he got on a tip in where, you know, he's just running the floor, trying to you know be in the right spot. Juwan Morgan draws a, a defender away. Things open up for him. He, he makes the put back, gets fouled, makes the free throw. And then there was another play at the end of the first half. Uh, I forget who it was that missed a free throw, but Clifton really went hard after the ball, tried to get around Penn state, swatted at it. They, they ended up giving the ball to IU. I'm not sure. Whether it, they we didn't get a replay, though <laughs> they couldn't review it. Thank God, um, but you know, so maybe it, it shouldn't have. But either way, his hustle really kept the ball alive. IU was up two at that point. If IU doesn't get the ball, the Penn State just gets the rebound. They go down with a chance to tie or take the lead going into halftime. Instead, Moore's effort leads to the ball getting tipped out of bounds. IU gets it. Finnessy ends up getting a bucket before the half, and IU goes in up four. Um, so Ryan, as someone tonight who manned the assembly call, uh, Twitter account, there were many questions that I received about based on this performance. I, why have we not seen Clifton Moore earlier? So what would you, how would you categorize Clifton's performance tonight? I thought there were some ups and downs. What did, what did you think? Yeah, I thought there were some ups and downs and you can probably tell that the reason Clifton isn't playing might be practice related. And, and you saw defensively, he looked a little out of place, but at least he's tall and long and can get in the way kind of, but he did get beaten a few times and they pulled him out on the floor. Uh, but he looked like he moved pretty well. He looked like a guy who has an idea what he's doing out there. He looks like he's got some confidence. I, I like what Clifton brings. I would like to see more of him and hopefully you know, not, no pun intended. Uh, but I, I think that, sorry, dude, I had to say no pun intended. Um, I, but I have to, I have to say that there's, there's gotta be a reason why he's not playing and hopefully it's practice effort and he's a young guy and, and hopefully he's, you know, getting better and that's why we saw him also nice of him to get on the floor in his hometown uh we did not see or home state i should say and we did not see jake forrester get on the floor so it wasn't like they were just throwing him in because he was back home uh they threw him in because they needed somebody and i thought he did pretty well he did have two turnovers in a, in you know a brief spe- spell but yeah you know three points four uh rebounds one of them offensive a steal he had a nice block uh, he's a big guy, and you're going to need a guy like that in the Big Ten with some length, especially if Deron Davis's, you know, recovery continues to sort of lag on. And you should expect it to because it has hasn't even been a year since Deron Davis had his his uh, Achilles surgery. So I'm not expecting Deron Davis at 100 percent really at all this season. Maybe not till late in the season. So uh, hopefully a guy like Clifton Moore can provide a lift and provide some some minutes. And I thought he did a good job at today. And one thing I noticed on along the lines of Clifton Moore. Indiana was going with a lot of two big lineups. They were going with Fitzner and Davis out there or Fitzner and Moore out there. Clearly, they wanted some more length against this Penn State team. Uh, and that's something we haven't seen a whole lot of this year. You know, and, you know, I, I kind of like that because Fitzner's not really a post guy. He's a perimeter guy. So why not add some extra length and, and you know, if he's in the game, put somebody in the, in the post as well. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty solid decision. And I thought that when they were playing together, that was part of the time where Indiana really stretched the lead. Yeah, I think he, for me, the biggest thing with him was just energy. Some of it was, most of it was used in a positive way. I mean, he played seven minutes in that first half, had three points, four rebounds, uh, committed a couple of fouls, committed a couple of turnovers, had a block and a steal. So did a little bit of everything in that time period. Uh, I think defensively is probably why, in, in my eyes, based on what we saw in this limited sample size, is why he's not playing more. He did struggle a little bit 
um, on that end of the floor. But I do think as an effort energy guy off the bench that there's something there. And he certainly did enough in this game to warrant giving him additional opportunities. Part of his opportunity tonight was Deron Davis getting in foul trouble. Basically, everybody over 6'5", for you got in foul trouble in the first half in this game, it felt like. So uh, Archie was trying to steal minutes, but that's a case where the depth really comes in handy and, and Clifton stepped up and played well. So uh, was was happy to see that for him. Didn't play in the second half. I'm not sure. I don't believe Deron Davis played in the second half either. So I think it was just a, you know the rotation got got quite a bit shorter there. Um, I guess Davis played two minutes in the second half. So, so not very much. Clifton didn't play at all. The rotation really got, got pretty And tight. again, with uh, Davis, I know he, Davis wound up getting his fourth foul, but also with Davis, if he plays well in the first half and then you don't see him in the second half, it could be the fact that he goes to halftime and his leg, you know, you cool down a little and his leg just doesn't respond well to coming back and getting ready and, and loosening back up. So that could be an issue we could see moving forward this year until he's back to full strength, which he clearly is not at this point. Yeah, there was, there was one other you know, kind of stretch of moments in the second half that I wanted to talk about. Um, Romeo had made a, a two, his only basket of the second half, pushed the lead back up to 10. Uh, Devontae Green gets a block on a three-pointer coming out of a timeout uh, for Penn State, but then... I think two turnovers right in a row from Devontae Green and, and Penn State gets a gets a bucket, gets the lead back under 10. But a couple different times, IU had answers right away. Al had a nice, I think that was the drive where he basically got chucked into the first row, but of course no foul was called. Uh, you know, answers. Why would push, there be any? Pushes why, it back to 10. Yeah, why would there be? Meanwhile, Penn State's biggest guy gets like touched on the screen and acts like he just got hit by a bus. Um, and then Penn State hits a three. Juwan comes down and answers. And I think it was those you know, to me, kind of little moments. And then the next one, Stevens is the, gets it to a four-point game, and then Finnessy goes on that run that I touched on in the Banner moment. I, I just thought there were times when, you know, even though the late-game execution was not good, there were a number of times in the second half when things could have started to get tight, and IU always seemed to have a response. Now, that response they were poised. Went away, um, you know, in those last four minutes. But I, I did think, you know, guys stepping up and making big plays, and at least in those couple that I mentioned, you know, Al, and, you know, a sophomore, which on this team, I think kind of constitutes being a veteran to a certain extent. Really and, does. Uh, and Juwan and Juwan as a senior, you know, made big baskets. So I thought that was good to kind of stem the tide, you know, keep the momentum at bay uh, a little bit uh, there during that stretch. But, uh, you know, those were those are kind of the moments. Any other moments in particular stand out to you before we hit stats? No, I absolutely I think it's the ones you mentioned. And, and obviously, you know, I think. And any time after that first sort of spurt by Penn State, I thought that IU really settled down and focused and, uh, and 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 sort of took it to Penn State. But they did it with defense. I mean, Penn State was missing free throws, and that really helped IU get right back in the game. But at the same time, IU's defense was tough. And and even when Penn State was scoring early on, I didn't think the defense was completely out of whack. I just thought that it was maybe you know guys weren't really warmed up. And, and they were just kind of scrambling a little early and locked in, they weren't locked into the game. But then once they did get locked in, I mean, they played good defense for the rest of the game. I, you know, Penn State shot 37%. They shot 23.8% from three. Uh, they, and that's because IU was harassing them. They didn't give up clean looks. And even when Penn State was scoring in the paint, they were usually scoring over people or around people. They, there were no open layups, open looks, any of that. And so I would say that I thought the defense stepping up right after that first four minutes was really the key to the entire game because then Romeo, then that gave you stopping them there a couple times gives Romeo Lankford the chance to get going, gives, you know, Juwan Morgan the chance to get a couple buckets inside, gives guys to really settle into the game and it gives guys the chance to really settle into the game and, and work on the offense while you're getting stops. So I thought that was really the key was right after that first uh, four minute timeout, the under four timeout to start the game under 16 timeout. I mean, first four minute timeout um, really getting stops defensively was what changed the momentum of the game. And I thought put Indiana right back into it and they went on a pretty big run. Yeah. During those, you know, so they gave up, it was a nine Oh after the, at the first media timeout at the next two segments between uh, media timeouts. IU only gave up five points over a you know you figure that's a roughly eight minute span. And by the end of that point, IU had actually taken the lead at fifteen yeah. fourteen. So to your point, uh, that was uh, that was big as well. So you're listening to the assembly call. I am Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips, and now it's time to go inside the numbers. And I guess let's start uh, let's start on the defensive end since you you brought that up. IU holds Penn State to 0.86 points per possession. Uh, Penn State aided that a little bit by uh, shooting an abysmal 11 of 26 from the free throw line. Uh, I believe they were four of 14 at halftime uh, from the line. They did not shoot 
the three well, um, took some really contested threes. I, I honestly don't know what their offensive philosophy was coming into the game, but um, I do think some of that was aided by IU. Lamar Stevens held to 12 points on 5 of 13 shooting, um, did end up with a double-double and had 10 rebounds, drew a number of fouls, but um, you know, again, forced, forced their leading scorer, a guy averaging over 20 points a game to just 12 uh, and and did so fairly inefficiently. So I thought IU's defense, uh, as you mentioned, was was really solid. So uh, I guess let's start there. So let's talk about what they did with Lamar Stevens because we might as well get to Justin Smith because uh, another thing I've learned from uh, manning the Twitter account the last couple yeah. of games is that he is a uh, he's a polarizing player. He would be, he would be what I would call a lightning rod. Yes, a lightning rod. Yes, that is exactly true. So he ends up he ends up zero for four. Doesn't score, but does have nine rebounds. Had three turnovers. Um, you know, but I thought he really he struggled a lot on the offensive end, and he's clearly in his own head. Really made shots yeah. more difficult than they needed. It's mental. It's clearly mental with him offensively. It really is because he's second guessing every move he makes, and you could tell he hesitates on everything, and it's in his mind. And you know what? If I, I would hate to see his Twitter mentions right now, and, and I'm sure that's getting in his head, and he needs to just block that out and and just play because he was uh, honestly in stretches he was a much better player last year, and we know he can be a better player than he's been this year. So it's really a focus thing. But you're right about but, the, yeah credit where credit is due. I thought he was a big part of IU being able to to defend Lamar Stevens as well as they did. You know, every, a lot of people had a chance on him in the first half with all the foul trouble. I think they played ended up playing Juwan on him a little bit more than they thought. But I do, you know, Ju- Justin led the team in rebounds, I believe, with nine. He had nine um, and three offensive rebounds, too. He kept some plays alive. I mean, yeah. there's some so, positives there. It was, yeah, there are some positives for him to build on, um, you know, but still some struggles for sure. But I, I do want to give him credit for what he did uh, to help limit Lamar Stevens. I think his his play on that end of the floor was was worthy of praise. I think his play on the offensive end at times was worthy of some criticism, but I thought, you know, overall, um, he, he played, you know, one end of the floor played really well. Um, I, I felt like for the most part. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Stevens, Stevens only had 12 points, five of 13 from the field, no three pointers, you know, over three, uh, they, they harassed him all night long. And that's what you have to do to the other team's best player. And, and you look at what Romeo was able to do against what was pretty solid defense. He was able to create those step back opportunities. Stevens wasn't able to do that. And that's because of the length that Indiana put on him. So, uh, you know, criticize all you want, the late game execution and all that stuff. But defensively, IU came out to play and played very hard. And Justin Smith was part of that. And as we said on the radio show last week, if you guys weren't there to hear it, um, we said he needs to start from the defense forward. And he needs to become a lockdown defender. He's athletic enough to do it. He needs to not be flat-footed. He needs to be on his toes. And he needs to start as a lockdown defender, then work on rebounding, and then work on the offense. Move back to forward. Because there's guys on this IU team who could score. What you need is another guy of his size who can defend and get rebounds in the Big Ten, and then let the offense come that way. Because clearly, again, it's in his head, and he needs to build some confidence. Yeah, I mean, Archie mentioned even after the last game, you know, trying to get him transition opportunities, really get him started. And that's what we saw in some of the early non-conference games is that was when he really yep. um, was able to build some confidence. So hopefully that comes in a game against a team like Penn State that really wants to slow it down. Transition opportunities were limited. Uh, IU just had two fast break points and, and even Penn State only had 10. So um, not a great game for that part of his uh, his arsenal to get going. But uh, and another uneven performance and, and one that... Uh, I think people are going to see what they want to see with him uh, at this point until until things turn around. Uh, other statistical things. So turnovers. Mentioned that IU did a great job taking care of the ball in the first half. They had going into the the last stretch after you know going into the under four timeout in the first half. They had three turnovers. Um, that changed quickly. Uh, they ended up with only five in the first half. That uh, that got away from them a bit in the uh, in the second half. I mean, there was one long the stretch where it was bad. Yeah, there was. Yeah, I mean, I, I was trying to look at the times here. There was, yeah, a few of these stretches. I mean, there's one at nineteen thirty three, seventeen thirty six, sixteen fourteen, fifteen thirty nine, thirteen thirty two, twelve twenty four, ten oh two, nine thirty seven. I mean, you're you're just halfway into the second half, and I think they had nine, eight or nine uh, at that point. They did take a little bit better care of the ball for a stretch there until, you know, turn it over a, a couple times in the last couple minutes. But it was just a, I mean, there was not four straight possessions, but Devontae Green made four straight, four straight turnovers for IU at one point in the right. second half. So it was in like a stretch of like five minutes or so. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Between, yeah, between the third, yeah, about four minutes between the 1332 mark and the 937 mark, he turned it over four times. So 
you know, again, kind of a mixed bag. I think everybody was worried coming into the game because that's something that Penn State had proven really adept at defensively, came in as a really highly rated uh, defensive team on Ken Palm and, and showed that tonight. IU didn't score a point per possession. Uh, I think it was in the point nine four range. And, and felt really good about what IU had done taking care of the basketball in the first half. And then they kind of went to a little bit more of that three-quarter court, three-quarter court, you know, press. We're really took trapping. a soft press. Yeah, yeah. we're really trapping a whole lot. I think just to kind of throw off the rhythm. And that really seemed to, to do that. And at times IU was tentative and at times they were sped up. Um, so the turnovers continued to be an issue. Um, led to 16 points for Penn State off those turnovers. Um, so that was, that was one thing rebounding ended up pretty close. Um, I typically don't cite rebound margin, but IU was down nine, one in rebounds by the first media timeout and ended up, uh, losing the rebounding battle 43 to 42. So did give up 15 offensive rebounds to Penn state who I thought was a lot really of those good. were early. A lot of those were in the first yeah. four minutes. Uh, I don't know how many, but there were a lot in the first four minutes. Uh, and that was part of the way that Penn State was scoring, was they were getting second-chance opportunities and, and finishing them. Uh, so that was that was certainly a problem early on. And, and it, Penn State didn't shoot the ball well all night, even when they built that lead early. And the reason why they were able to get those that lead was because of second-chance points. Yeah, and that that was a big factor when they upset uh, Virginia Tech at home. Yep. That was a that was a big thing there. Virginia Tech doesn't have a, a lot of size, although I guess by some measures, you know, IU doesn't either. But um, so that was there. Any other numbers stand out? To, IU shot eleven of fourteen from the free throw line. Now, two of the the three misses really came late in mm-hmm. in more. They were ten of eleven situations. at one point. Yeah, um, yeah, they were just just shot. Uh, they were six of eight in the second half, and both misses came in the last couple minutes. So again. Um, you know, kind of a, a struggle there, but yeah, I think at one point they would have been, uh, I guess 11 for 11 for 12. I think they were 11 for their first 12. So, uh, yeah, I mean that the, the free throws are definitely a big deal. Also, who would have thought that if you look at the numbers, who would have thought that, uh, in a game, in a conference game on the road, I use three point shooting and free throws would have been the difference in their favor. Uh, is seven of 18 isn't great. It's 38%, but that's better. 38.9%. That's better than we've seen IU this year. And that, that was their three point, uh, mark and then 78.6 percent from the free throw line again not great this year but that's a great mark for them and they beat penn state badly in both uh in both categories so uh really that was the difference in the game if you look at the numbers because both teams made 23 field goals uh penn state out rebounded iu by one uh a lot again they had 15 offensive rebounds defensive rebounds iu crushed them 35 to 28 uh but they had those 15 offensive rebounds a lot of which came early uh, but then if you look at Penn State at 12 steals, uh, had only had 10 turnovers against IU's 26. IU fouled 21 times, Penn State only 16. So a lot of those numbers are in Penn State's favor, but IU hit its free throws and made some three-pointers, and that was the difference in the game. So really kind of puzzling that on the road, that's where IU would win the game, uh, especially when you consider the fact that their field goal percentage has been really good this year, particularly from two, and it wasn't tonight. Uh, they shot 41.8% overall for, for IU. Uh, not great. And everything else worked out for him. They found a way to win. I know it wasn't pretty. I know it was one of those oh, never doubt wins at the end. But you know what? They won a game on the road in the Big Ten in December. That's that's tough to do. Uh, it, you know, this isn't playing on campus with all the students in January and February, where it's a different uh, you know environment and atmosphere away. And, or, you know, home and on the road. Uh, so to go into Bryce Jordan Center and get a win, a place that. IU has not played particularly well the last few years uh, is, you know, really over the last decade has not played well there to get a win. It, it's a win. I'm happy with it. Yeah. One other quick thing, and this is a, a pattern, at least in these two big 10 games, IU shot uh, 14 threes in the first half, which felt like a few too many, although given their struggles at converting around the rim, maybe it was, maybe it was the right number, but second half only shot four. Um, and, and, you know, we're 50%, you know, made, made two of those four made, uh, you know, 11 of 22 from the field in total. So um, part of it didn't get as many shots because they're too busy turning the ball over. But uh, at least, you know, did, you know, kind of we, we saw that more attacking mentality in some cases where they weren't settling for threes as they really did and kind of got sucked into that a little bit in the first half. But then at other times, the, you know, the attacking mentality either went away completely or manifested itself in in questionable turnovers. So we'll, uh, you know, see what's to come there. But I do think that we saw a similar thing in the Northwestern game with the shift between where the shots were coming from changed uh, pretty dramatically from half to half. But coming up on the assembly call, we're going to continue our breakdown of Indiana's 64-62 win over Penn State. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the slow start and then uh, touch on Al Durham a bit, who I thought had another really good game uh, for IU. So we'll talk about that next after the break. That's here on the Assembly Call. Stick with us. You are listening to the Assembly Call IU Postgame Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night and Monday afternoon at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 6,000 fellow IU fans are subscribed. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips, and we are breaking down Indiana's 64-62 victory at Penn State tonight. Uh, and Ryan wanted to talk about the the beginning of the game, which was you know kind of ugly. IU fell behind. It, it feels like a a pattern of sorts uh, for this team that they really seem to come out without a lot of urgency, just, you know, getting, you know, all those offensive rebounds you talked about. I think Penn State had four offensive rebounds by the first media timeout, just really getting kind of outworked, sleepwalking through things a little bit. What, what do you make of that? Is there, is that, does that feel like a pattern to you or am I, you know, a prisoner of the moment thinking that that was, you know, something that happened tonight and extrapolating that to happening other times as well? I think you probably are extrapolating. No, they, they haven't had it start like this yet. And honestly, I'd rather well, have a team. To do, it's hard to do this. Yeah, hard to, hard to, start, hard to do it that But it was weird, though, because of the, the energy they were playing with on the defensive end. I, I wasn't really that worried when they were down 9 nothing. And also with basketball this year, and we're seeing this in the NBA a lot this year, you can have a 20-point lead these days. And with the three-pointer and with the way teams run, it really can come back in a hurry. So I wasn't really down or worried uh, I would have been worried if it got up to like 15, 16, 17, but at 9-0, you feel like that's three possessions now in, in, in college basketball and in, and in the NBA. So it's really can come back in a hurry. Um, I, I, but yeah, it, it is a little concerning. I think it's also first road game, first like uh, in-conference road game. It's a Tuesday night. It, you know, it, it's just not, this isn't, you know, a Friday night or Saturday night game at home where you can just be locked in getting on the court. That's why it's hard to win. And also, there's no atmosphere at the Bryce Jordan Center. There's nobody there. Uh, it's a muted atmosphere. It's a football. Well, there were at least two people there right behind the announcers. I know. Oh, my just God. Those two, though. I feel like that was giving a false impression of the noise there all that night. Happens, that happens every game. Every there. I feel like it's every game. This must be where their student section or whoever yeah. does. It's right behind the broadcasters. It has to be. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, whenever there's a dead atmosphere in a place, and honestly, that's why Saturday afternoon games stink and or Saturday or Sunday afternoon games stink is because the atmosphere isn't great. And it's hard to get yourself fired up when it's not loud. Even when you're on the road and it's loud, it's easier to get pumped up and, and focused because, you know, it's, there's energy in the building and there's just none at Price Jordan Center. And that might be why IU has struggled there so much. It's just, it's hard to get focused and hard to get into that game. So I, I, I kind of look at this as a bit of an aberration, um, but we'll see. I mean, it, it may become a pattern, but again, it's December 4th. They win and I got to win. I don't care. I didn't like the way they played the, the first five minutes and the last five minutes, but in between, we saw some good basketball. Uh, and again, it's a younger team. I mean, as you said, you know, we're kind of considering Al Durham and Justin Smith as guys who were veterans on this team who we're relying on, and they're sophomores who haven't started before. And I mean, Justin Smith did a few times last year, but in general, he's not a starter and you're relying on these guys heavily to, to do stuff. So it, it's you're a lot of these guys are going through this for the first time uh, as starters and guys who need to come out of the gate hot and it's showing. And, and so hopefully again, it's something they get used to that being in that position and they build on it. I, we don't have time today, but maybe on Thursday, I'd like you to go through the times and days of the week that it is acceptable to play games because I feel like the open windows. Oh, no, Tuesday like, night's fine. I'm just <laughs> saying it's not a Saturday evening at home. You know, like a, a Tuesday's fine. I mean, everybody's playing on a Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever. Uh, Monday might kind of be lame. I think Mondays are lame. But other than that, you're, you're fine. Uh, what did if Big Ten used to always do? Was it Tuesday? Was it Thursday, Saturday, every game? Thursday, Saturday, and then occasionally they'd have a swing game to a Sunday or something. Uh, they, they used back to do the more of like they would have some Monday night games. Like they would be part of like I think they were part of Super Tuesday way back in the time. But oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you have to have games every day so that you can have some on Fox. Which is so stupid because you know teams wind up getting Thursday, Saturday, and things like that, and getting screwed. Yeah. Up. You should have to have at least like two days between games at least. Um, you know, two days off between games at least, but you know, that's, it's all about TV money now. God. Yeah. So what, all right, I'm just going to full get off my lawn. Reel reel it back in. All right. Reel it in. Um, 
So one of the things that kind of pulled out IU out of that rough start in the first half was uh, some strong play from the bench. You know, one of the runs, uh, I think, where IU took the lead, Devontae Green hit a couple threes right in a row. Uh, so I thought he had a really good lift, played well defensively, uh, particularly in the first half. We talked about Clifton Moore. Uh, Duran actually made the first basket of the game on like a, a 10 foot hook shot in the lane, um, which was gorgeous, by the way, Jer- Jared Morris was loving that. I know somewhere he was it, just, it was just it was one of those, shot. it was the, one of those where it's like of all the shots that I had taken right at the rim early in the game, like the first one that goes in is, is that hook shot, which was uh, a solid shot, but not necessarily one that it's like, yeah, you're a little, maybe, maybe far for that. Nope. That's in range. So yeah, it was perfect. Uh, just right in his, right in his wheelhouse. So, you know, now that we've seen, you, know, you talked about, you talked about fantasy really, you know, maybe solidifying himself as, you know, there's no turning back at this point after the way he played in this. But I, I do think Devonte could really play a good role off the bench in the way that he did tonight. I thought he really provided uh, some offense, provided a spark defensively. Uh, or, do you start to think that that's, you know, maybe his best role? The, in the turnovers be- in the second half were not good at all. Um, but but I thought he really, you know, provided something good because Finney got off to a really slow start, and Devontae really picked up the slack. He did, and and Finney was great in the second half, but was not that great in the first half. I mean, quite frankly, and uh, Devontae did provide a pretty big spark in that thirty-minute period we're talking about in the middle of the game. Devontae was a big part of that until he started turning the ball over, and he was a huge part of that run and a huge part of helping IU get us get a big lead. And uh, those turnovers were a problem, and Archie Miller clearly will not stand for that. Uh, but Devontae is a guy you can trust at the free throw line too. So if he's not turned the ball over, he can be a guy that can really help you in a lot of ways. And, and you know, he had a couple of nice hits, some really nice assists. Uh, he rebounded the ball uh, and he played solid defense. You're right. And, and so hopefully again, it's just like the rest of the guys. You see those four turnovers, you cut out that four turnover stretch and we might be talking about Devontae as one of the keys to this game as IU getting that big lead when he was on the floor and handling all the ball a lot. So uh, if you cut that one, you know, four minute stretch out, you know, he's had a really great game. So it's about watching the film, realizing what he did. And maybe he took some chances in there that he shouldn't have taken. And then there was one where he kind of stumbled and fell off balance and dribbled it off his leg. That happens. It's, you don't want it to happen, but he kind of dribbled left and stumbled and the ball went off his foot and went out of bounds. Eh, You know, it's hard to be upset about that because he just tripped, but, at the same time, there were other ones that were bad. There were passes. Uh, there was one pass. He also, one of his turnovers, he passed it to Justin Smith, who I think Justin got bumped on the cut and didn't get to where he was supposed to get for the pass. And that got stolen and, and brought down for a, um, for a breakaway chance for Penn State. But again, you, you can't make that many excuses for a veteran guy. He should know if he doesn't see Smith where he's supposed to be, he's got to put that in his pocket and look to the next, uh, you know, look to the next target. Uh, but again, it, you know, Devonte hat showed some nice stuff. We've seen this before from him where he shows some solid stuff and then has stretches that just make you shake your head. And at some point he's got to grow past that. He's a junior. He's got to grow past that. It's okay to make a bad pass. It's okay to make a mistake, dribble the ball, but it's not okay to do it a bunch of times in the row where you could allow a team to get back into the game. Yep. I would agree with you. You're listening to the assembly call. This is Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips, and we're breaking down IU 64-62 win over Penn State. So, Ryan, two other guys I wanted to touch on. Uh, the first was Al Durham. So he, you know, it might be another case where you know he's kind of worked his way into the starting lineup, and uh, at this point, Archie seems pretty content to to ride with who's in there. Thought Al played well again. Ended up with 12 points, uh, including I think eight in the second half. Um, you know, he along with Finnessy and Morgan scored the scored 26 of IU's 30 points in the second half. Um, so I thought he, you know, he made some big shots. He was uh, perfect from the floor in the second half. Uh, and overall, I thought played another solid game, was um, was decent defensively, had one rebound, two assists, just one turnover. Um, you know, I think he's starting to really, you know, carve out a role for himself on this team, or at least his role is starting to become a little bit more clear as to as to what it's going to be and i think that's something that we didn't really know uh very well early on that is he going to play some point is he going to is he going to do this is he going to do that i thought you know he's really his three-point shooting seems to have improved um maybe that regresses a A little bit as we go but um he's not afraid to take the ball to the basket and and i thought had another solid game for al I, I agree. I mean, 12 points from Al Durham is not something I was expecting coming into this game. Uh, he had four or six from the free throw line. One of those misses was late and it was big, but he looks confident there and he's, you know, clearly stepping up and just 
getting into the shot. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that first of all, it's always without, it's going to start defensively. Um, and I, I think that that's where he plays his best basketball is on the defensive end, but he's starting to be a guy who can do more offensively. Now the one turnover he had was terrible. It was a cross court pass in a situation where you can't make the cross court pass uh, late in a game when Penn state's hunting steals like that uh, really a boneheaded play. But again, sophomore made a, de- made a dumb play in a key situation. That's going to happen. Uh, he has to reel that in and I'm sure he's going to watch film and want to fall out of his seat when he sees it. Uh, but that I mean, that was like to me, that was like the rookie quarterback being baited into an interception. I mean, that's exactly what happened. And so Al, again, some really solid play. One of the keys to the win, I thought, just the way he played, the confidence with which he's shooting threes right now is incredible. And and especially when you go back to last season and before last season, we had all these questions about his shot. And somebody asked him, I remember in an interview, somebody asked him, Well, you're gonna change your shot because it was kind of ugly in high school. And he's like, Nope, my shot is fine. And uh, I kind of love that confidence from Al, and he's always had that, and he plays like it. And so, yeah, I thought it was a good game for him on both ends of the court, and um, he's just got to, you know, clean up some things, but so does everybody. It's early. Yep, yep, I would agree. Uh, The other guy, we haven't really touched on Juwan very much, uh, given, you know, that his status heading into the game was really one of the big storylines. Did suit up and play with a a wrap and uh, potentially some padding on uh, on his shin. Okay. Um, I thought at times, I, I thought early in the game seemed like it took him a while to get loose and like really move around as well as you might expect. But he did finish yeah. with 10 points, was just 5 of 12 from the floor. Had a, had a little bit of trouble finishing around the basket, I felt like, more so than, than other times. And Penn State was pretty physical, um, you know, really really trying to body guys inside. And Juwan uh, wasn't getting calls, particularly early yeah. in the second yeah. half. He was not getting any calls. And there were some that needed to be made. Yes, I would I would agree with you there. Had six rebounds. Again, got in foul trouble, um, did only have one turnover. I thought, you know, again, it was a case where some of the fouls, I think Sean Morris said something about, like, he, he couldn't make one of the fouls. If I remember that one correctly, it was where, like, Hare or Harar, or however you say the guy's name at Penn State, like, basically just plowed over Romeo, and then Juwan just kind of was somewhat wrong place, wrong time, and just kind of got caught with his hand in the cookie jar a little bit for that foul. I, You know, I, there was a there was a play where he almost went over somebody's back to pick up his fourth much earlier than he actually did pick up his fourth. Yeah. Um, but again, I thought yeah. IU showed the ability to when he got his fourth, they took him out for a few minutes toward the end of the game and they executed um, during that stretch. But I thought kind of an uneven performance for him. But I, you know, certainly appreciative of him. You know, gutting out the injury. They they said he mentioned after the game it was one of the most painful things, if not the most painful thing. Uh, he'd had, and for a guy who was routinely like popping his shoulder out of socket during games, and then guess, popping I, it back in, <laughs> I feel like that's saying something to say yeah. that the pain was that much worse. But uh, anything stand out to you from his performance tonight, other than just kind of gutting it out and and giving IU some contributions? Uh, you know, I thought he was active defensively for a lot of the game, and especially coming off the Northwestern performance where he just kind of got abused inside because he he faced a really good player. Uh, I thought he really showed up and, and played some solid defense and, you know, was battling on uh, rebounds the entire game until he got his fourth foul and then came back in late. And really, I thought that after he got that fourth foul and came back in, it was almost like he he was cold. He wasn't, you know, really uh, warm. He went to the basket once uh, in a key situation late and didn't even get a good shot. And um, But, you know, there was a long stretch again where he was just getting hammered inside, not getting the calls. Big Ten game on the road guess what uh but i thought the first half you know he was key and i thought early in the second half he was key but really not his best game but the thing is is that you have him and what i think uh is key though in in what's what's really a good sign is the last two games without him really doing much late indiana's pulled out wins and if he's healthy indiana's not going to need to do that much this year and so the last two games to open the conference season to get wins with Jawan Morgan is on the sideline or just struggling is enormous. I also think key, the key late has to be to get the ball in the hands of Romeo Langford and Jawan Morgan. Jawan Morgan on the block is almost unstoppable uh, for a team like Penn State. They did pretty well bottling him up tonight, but I think that you have to get him the ball late in the post. And I didn't think I, you did that. They were kind of, I think that maybe they were thinking about it, but didn't force the ball into him. And I think they really need to do that. He's the senior leader. He needs to go attack. And then if the double comes, they reverse it and find Romeo, because that's the other guy you got to get the ball in the hands of. And uh, you saw Rob Finnessy kind of be the closer tonight. And that was kind of surprising. It was Romeo against Northwestern. 
Yep. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this segment. We're going to uh, we're going to come back. We're going to hand out our game ball for this game. Look ahead uh, briefly to the IU Louisville game. We'll have more time to do that on Assembly Call Radio this week. And then in last call, we'll deliver our final thoughts on Indiana's 64-62 win at Penn State. That's next here on the Assembly Call. Stick with us. We're listening to the Assembly Call IU postgame show. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Ryan Phillips, and we are wrapping up our breakdown of IU 64-62 victory at Penn State. And now it's time to hand out our game balls. At this point, Romeo has taken a 4-3 to three lead over Juwan. Um, but I have a feeling that a, uh, somebody who doesn't have one yet may uh, may get on the board uh, in this game. So, Ryan, I'll kick it to you first. For uh, who, 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 Who's getting votes in the chat? Oh, I don't know. I, I haven't looked. Oh, okay. No, I oh, thought you I'm, said... No, I'm thinking... Oh, you mean on the season? Okay. Based, yeah, on our, on the season. Yes. Okay. What, our, what's but, the standings on the season? Uh, I believe it's... Now you're going to make me look it up again. It was... Uh, I think four four, three, fourth. Yeah. Romeo has four. Juwan okay. has three. Duran has one. Okay. Well, yes. I'm going in a different direction. I got to give it to Rob Fennessy for his second half. Uh, 10 of his 12 points in the second half. Finished with five rebounds, five assists, a steal, a block, one turnover. Made some great plays going to the rim. Uh, hit a big three, two late uh, when he kind of stepped out and nobody came to get him and he just buried it. Big deal. Uh, great game from fantasy. I also thought he scrambled for some key rebounds that were, you know, not just right under the basket. They were bouncing out and they were kind of free loose balls and he went and got them. Uh, so really for me, Rob was the guy to take the game ball tonight. Romeo had a great first half, but I, I thought Rob closed the show really well. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give mine to fantasy as well. I, I think we've talked other times there were, there were instances where, you know, maybe Juwan or, or other guys played really ro- well and Romeo took over down the stretch where they really needed it and we've given him the game ball. Uh, Romeo certainly led the big comeback in the first half after a really slow start, played fantastic, but Rob Finnessy made a lot of winning plays, as cliche as that may sound, down the stretch in this game and really pushed the lead out to, uh, you know, to that 11-point mark you know, down the, down the stretch before, you know, everything went to hell there for a little while. But uh, I, I thought in that really key stretch when Penn State had gotten it within four, he played terrific. Uh, I'm not sure who they credited with the steal on the very last play of the game after the lengthy review slash free timeout for Penn State. Um, but uh, I, he was, his defense on that play was really good. Um, so he may or may not have gotten credit for it. I think I saw Justin Smith maybe in one thing got credit for it, but Finnessy played really good defense on that uh, that inbound play. Didn't even let Penn State get off a shot. So just those kinds of winning plays from a freshman in his first Big Ten road game, not his first road game. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk about maybe going to Arkansas and going to Duke. Does that start to pay dividends for these guys the next time they're in that scenario? Maybe too much to say that that was the case tonight, but um, but we'll, uh, we'll at least give a little bit of credit to that. And I think Finnessy... Certainly deserves that. So he is on the board with his first uh, first game ball of the season. First two. Well, yeah, but we'll only count one. I think we're doing it by game in these uh, oh, in the annex no here. Don't, don't try to confuse things. Um, Just working on it. Just trying. To all right. So so next up for us uh, as a show, we have Assembly Call Radio on Thursday, and then the IU Louisville post game show on Saturday. A uh, quick look ahead to Louisville. Again, we'll get into this a bit more. Uh, on the Thursday show, they're currently 48th in Ken Palm right now. As I look at this, what was they're, Penn State? Penn State's pretty high, weren't they? Penn State was higher than I would have expected. They were. They uh, beat the, they beat a number 13 team or something. Yeah, they're 37th now. They had beaten uh, Virginia Tech, so I think that was a, a big part of it. But uh, yeah, so they're 30. They're 37th now um, as we go through. So that should be a, a good win. Any kind of road win from IU's perspective is a is a good win at this point. So Louisville currently currently just inside the top 50. Had that big Michigan State overtime win at home that that really caught people by surprise in the Big Ten ACC Challenge. Although um, they were probably should have beaten Marquette in the NIT in the uh, in the third place game there, but um, some calls didn't go their way in the second half of that game. And then they won at Seton Hall over the weekend, who's a bit down from where they were last year, but still uh, road win at a Big East team. So they've got a game tomorrow against Central Arkansas that will not be a challenge, and then come to IU. Uh, Ken Palm gives IU a 74% chance of winning, if I'm if I'm doing the math correctly here. Um, looking at the Louisville side, um, you know, new coach for them with Chris Mack. I think, you know, as somebody who lives in Cincinnati and has seen what he's done at Xavier, it was a really good hire for them and is going to do 
and already has done some pretty good things given the roster um, that he inherited, got some grad transfers to kind of cobble things together. So uh, I think they've been better than people expected to this point. Um, neither loss that they have is bad by any means, losing to Tennessee, losing to Marquette. Uh, no shame really in either of those. So they're currently a little bit better on the defensive or in the offensive side uh, from an efficiency standpoint and have the number one free throw rate in the country at this point, which given I use foul issues is maybe the most concerning thing to uh, to look at as you as you go into the game. So we'll touch more on that, um, but certainly it would be a difficult game, but IU glad to be going home, get a few days to, to rest and heal for that one. And uh, again, another chance to get a quality non-conference win for IU that uh, with my, you know, bracketology hat on could be a really important one as we, uh, as we go forward in the season. You're listening to the assembly call IU post game show. And remember that because you're an assembly call listener, you get 15% off your entire order at hoosierproud.com and at homefieldapparel.com. So if you want officially licensed IU gear, go to homefieldapparel.com. And if you want one of our assembly call logo t-shirts or one of Hoosier Proud's unique Indiana inspired designs, visit hoosierproud.com. On both sites, use the promo code assembly at checkout to get 15% off your entire order. All right, it's time for last call. So Ryan, I'll let you uh, I'll let you do the honors here with your last call and uh, feel free to hit on any other lingering thoughts or topics that we didn't get to uh, over the course of our discussion about the game. Well, two Big Ten games, two wins. That's the key here and both by two points. But you know what? Take the win. And also winning in close games might help you at the end of the year. So yeah, they showed some poise. They showed, they they fell behind uh, the eight ball a little bit as far as poise goes over the last five minutes. But that's something they can correct. Uh, again, I've said this a couple times tonight. It's December 4th, and IU is 2-0 in the Big Ten. That's all you need to worry about right now. This team will get better as these as guys come back from injury and are, and are in the mix more. I think this team will play much better, uh, and they'll be deeper, and they'll have different and better guys to rely on. Uh, and then, you know, in the second half of the season, when we start getting into that conference season, hopefully these wins will help them. Also, they stole a rolled win, which are gold in the Big Ten. So, Huge win tonight just to get that out of the way. They didn't play perfectly, but that's fine. They need stuff to improve on. You've got film to show, and you've got things that guys need to improve on moving forward. Win is a win. I'd rather win an ugly game than lose it. So you know what? I'm going to bed happy tonight. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, a lot of what you said, you know, to be able to start 2-0 in the Big Ten, we talked about this four-game stretch. What can I do in it? Well, they're minimum 500 at this point, even if they would you know, lose these next two games. You've still got a chance to go 4-0, which would be a huge boost heading into the last couple non-conference games of the season. Uh, and I think both the last games are are winnable. I, you know, it, It's starting to become more and more clear. This team is not good enough offensively and doesn't take good enough care of the basketball at this point that they're going to run away from anybody. So I think we better all get used to a lot of these close game, nail-biter uh, type of scenarios. But it was one where IU found a way to win the game uh, tonight after a really poor start and a really poor finish. Uh, they played well in the middle, um, but different guys stepping up. You know, the fact that, you know, Finnessy, uh played so well down the stretch bodes well for the future. Uh, the fact that guys in these last two games, other than Juwan Morgan down the stretch when he's been on the bench, either injured or in foul trouble, have been able to step up bodes well for what this team can be. Um, at a certain point, you do have to get worried about the turnovers. That doesn't seem to be correcting itself in at least a sustainable way to this point. So, um don't want to put on the completely rose-colored glasses and pretend that everything was fantastic with this game because it certainly wasn't. Um, but they fa- found a way to win when they weren't playing well uh, or not playing their best, at least. Um, and so I think that's something to build on, something that hopefully gives them some confidence, but uh, certainly no shortage of things to go back and look at and work on uh, as you go into the film. But, um, y- you know, you look at a team like Iowa coming coming into these early Big Ten games and their draw was much di- more difficult than I used, but they've dug themselves an 0-2 hole that they've got to try to get out of now. Uh, IU at least. Yeah, how much, how much better do you feel right now being 2-0 and than Iowa fans do, regardless of how yeah. well they've played? Yeah, yeah. Based on how they played, they had, you know, they had tougher games. I'm not, you know, uh, the, the two games that each team had were not equal, but uh, a good feeling to be at this point and really try to build. So it's a it's a progression. Uh, the Louisville game will bring different challenges, but I will be back home. Should be a really good crowd uh, for that one. I think it's not it's Saturday, but it's not around noon. So I think Ryan will be okay uh, with the game time and the in the venue. So we should be okay on that. That should be a uh, that should be a positive. But um, you know something to, something to build on. Not a perfect performance. I don't think we're going to get too many perfect performances out of this team. Just given the youth and what we've seen from some of these guys, but they found a way to win. And, uh, you know, at some point they found a way to win. Maybe that will be a refrain that we won't feel comfortable continuing to use. But for now, 
uh, we're going to stick with it and uh, and just kind of enjoy the fact that they got a road win in a in a game that uh, they could easily have have given away and could easily have let get away from them when they got off to such a poor start. So credit to them for for fighting back, getting lead at halftime, building on that lead, and uh, just got to find a way to continue building on it down the stretch instead of giving some of it back. But uh, that's what the uh, that's what the coaching staff is there for to get them better and to continue to uh, help this young team improve as we go over the course of the season. So that will do it for this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. You can also subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk IU Hoops again with you on Thursday night for Assembly Call Radio. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. Go Hoosiers. Thank you for being here and for listening to this episode of the Assembly Call. We appreciate it. And we really do rely on the support of audience members like you to keep our show going and to keep growing. And so we have set up a page on our website at assemblycall.com slash support that lists five ways that you can support the Assembly Call. And we encourage you to choose whichever method is the easiest and most convenient for you. One of the methods is donating, and so many of you have donated, and we appreciate it so much. On that page, you can choose a monthly recurring donation or an annual recurring donation or just a one-time donation, whatever works for you. And if you don't want to donate, another way to support the show is you can use our affiliate URLs, iutickets.shop or iustore.shop when you're going to shop for tickets or gear, and we will get paid a small commission when you use those links. But however you support the show, We appreciate it. Thank you.